Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Obsessing over every detail means we're confident in offering a 100% quality guarantee. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's, so thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover. All for just three bucks, plus free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter code FACE at checkout. That's harrys.com, code FACE. Enjoy! You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. I would like to tell you one final story before we begin. This is something that only recently happened to me. It's an encounter story. A dream I had. Thankfully, it's a short one because I don't like hearing other people's rando dreams either. Here goes. I'm in Vegas with two other women. I don't know them in real life, but in the dream, these are friends of mine. We're in a casino and have made our way down a couple flights of stairs into a sub-basement floor of the casino. And we go into the ladies' room. I'm in a stall chatting with the girls who are in a stall at the other end of what I think is an empty restroom. Suddenly, my friends go quiet, and I hop up on the toilet, and I pop my head up over, just, just over the top of the, where, over the st- like stall divider to see what's going on. Maybe because I sense something, or someone waiting is the uh, reason the girls stop talking. And there was. A distinctly blonde woman with long, straight hair is standing down at the far end, near to the stall my friends are in. She's standing as if waiting, though there are numerous empty stalls between us. The way she's standing, though, I assume there must be something wrong, as her head is dropped so far forward that her hair is kind of curtaining her face, and she is so still. Perplexed, I step down off the toilet and I go to open my door. When I step out, the woman is gone, and my friends suddenly emerge from the stall at the end, and they quietly hurry toward me. They grab the crook of my elbow and turn me toward the exit. We need to go, they say. Did you see a woman? I mutter, craning my neck to look to where the woman had just been standing, not moments before. As we pass through the door leading out, my friends whisper, whatever you do, do not look in any of the mirrors. Unfortunately, what they say doesn't register with me as we pass by a mirror directly facing us on our way through the door. And directly behind us in the reflection stands the woman. But now her head is up. I can see her face very clearly. It's rotted and gruesome. Her hair is flying around her face as if it's alive, though it, it too looks rotted and dried up and brittle. I quickly avert my eyes and allow my friends to drag me back to the stairs and up and up the flights toward the main exit. All the while, I continually remind myself to not look at anything that has a reflection because now I know she will be right behind me. It didn't occur to me until after I had awakened, but if you've ever been inside of any casino, you will know just how difficult it would be to avoid mirrors or reflective surfaces right? Now, my question for you guys listening, do you think it's possible that this was an old hag encounter? Did I just meet that nasty old bat? 
I didn't think this was her right after I woke up, but the dream was so surreal. You you know the kind. And it really just, oh, it just stayed with me throughout the day. And the more I thought about it, it just seemed more and more possible. You know? Especially if I take into account some recent, unfortunately, very stressful developments in my waking life. And we've talked about that before, that this is when these things like to come. So... Anyway, just wanted to share that with you because it's spooky and oh so apropos to our conversation and good timing on her part too, don't you think? Season finale and all. Welcome back to Paranorm Girl and welcome to our very first and fingers crossed, not very last season finale episode where your host, me, Kristen, will be laying all of the cards on the table and placing my bets. I think now I'm just fixating on Vegas. Um, I haven't been in a while. I, um, I, I definitely need to make that happen. I'm not a big gambler, but uh, you know I'll always put like a 20 into a machine just to play a little bit. Um, it's more about the shows and the drinking and the food and the, and the, the stumbling around and uncomfortable high heels for me. But I'll tell you all something. Um, I've always had a weird kind of luck in Vegas. It's something I don't have control over. So like if I start thinking, oh, I'm, I'm so lucky, then I definitely will not be lucky. Uh, it's only when I'm, I'm chill about it, you know, that things seem to happen to me. Um, and as far as Vegas is concerned, I, I always seem to win big so long as I mentally agree to and proceed to only play the once. Weird, right? But that's the pattern. All right. To the business at hand, folks. Shadow people. Kicking it off with some honesty here, right out the gate. Uh, I really thought, based on a lot of what I've come to realize, is fear-mongering that happens with this particular subject. That at some point during this season, with all of the researching and focus I had on this subject, it seemed fair to assume that I would see one. And I know I just told you about that dream, but uh, here's the skeptical believer in me. You ready? It was still just a dream. My assumption, if these things were real, was that I would have an undeniable encounter. I would would see a wisp or full figure out of my peripheral vision. I, I would wake to the hat man at the foot of my bed. I would start having issues with sleep paralysis, something, anything. But alas, I am, as far as I know, free from this experience. But this does support a point I'd like to quickly make about the unhelpfully superstitiousness we all have to some extent with the paranormal. The fear-mongering that surrounds this stuff only suffocates our ability to be objective about it. I had numerous folks that I didn't even know personally tell me to not say their name, to not talk about them, to not defend them, because if I did, unfortunately, it was a given that something terrible would happen. Ooh. It's similar to something I was only recently reminded of. Do uh, do y'all remember this weird fear-mongering surrounding Harry Potter? A lot of Christian groups were denouncing it, warning of its inherent evil agenda, uh, what might happen to a person's soul or their innocence if they should partake of the forbidden potter fruit. Like, in my opinion, what utter nonsense, right? Same idea here. Anyway, just a weird tangent. All of that being said, let's begin. Gonna cut to the chase right at the start and then reel it back in for the reveal. I... Kristen, insert last name here, on this day of our Harry Potter June 113 of 20 Doesn't Matter, do solemnly believe the shadow people to be real. And I will explain why shortly. In episode one, I claimed that I was 100% sure that something is going on. I still hold this belief. The what that I was after is now a little clearer to me. There seems to be these undeniable synchronistic connections supporting their existence, such as people with RH negative blood type being more likely to report these types of encounters, the connections that keep popping up uh, between alien abductees also encountering shadow people either at different times in their lives or at the time of their abduction. Um, Then there are the aspects to shadow people encounters that make them undeniably not just another fantasy or hallucination. Like, if someone claimed to have seen a unicorn while lost in the woods, I might have to question that a little bit. 
if a hundred people claim to have seen a unicorn in those same woods and described it the same way and described their encounter with it going the same way, I might sit forward and uh, like take a sip of coffee, you know? So not only do we have the thousands of reported encounters with these beings across the globe, we have the multiple reported encounters occurring between two people who report seeing the same entity at the same time or two people describe having seen the same entity just at different times or um, the encounters that occur while definitely not under the effects of sleep paralysis, but rather the exact opposite, as in the case of the story sent in to me I read at the beginning of episode four. The kid was just out riding his dirt bike in broad daylight when he spots this black silhouetted figure standing at the edge of the path leading out. It was so real and so unnerving for him that he wasn't quite sure he'd be able to make it out and seriously thought about leaving his bike and traipsing through the woods to go the long way around just to avoid having to go right by this thing. There's also the reported encounters by people when they were children, uh, some stating these experiences to have taken place when they were far too young to have drawn some kind of connection to this archetype or image from films or books they might have unconsciously soaked up into their psyche. And can we just admire for a moment that a majority of all of the reported encounters tend to follow the same recipe as far as what happens, how it makes them feel, how the entity appears to them, uh, and, and how the entity chooses to exit. I mean... Unless we are all born with this same experience already programmed into our DNA, I just don't know how that is possible. A ton of people report never even having heard of shadow people before their first encounter. So how do they know how the story goes, so to speak? How do they know just how to relay how it all went down? Episode 2, we discuss the history and lore of these things. The fact that the history of these things potentially existing in our lives, spanning back over 5,000 years, is astonishing in itself. And I say potentially existing because, of course, our earliest entity we covered on that episode, who I actually discovered in Mike Ricksecker's book, was regarded as what was considered a demon at the time. But the description of said demon was pretty damn similar to the reported descriptions of the current day shadow figure. And this shared description continues moving through time, you know? And I think we learned that the first recorded public usage of the term shadow people was in an article back in the late 1800s interviewing Madame de Esperance. She was describing some experiences she had had when with them when she was a child and comparing them to the experiences she was then having with them at that time as an adult. So we well know that their existence can be established throughout humanity's history. And if these weren't shadow people, what the hell were they? What were all of these people over the course of these centuries talking about? What was it that they were experiencing? Something was going on. I've laid out through the course of the season the numerous possible explanations for shadow people. I've mentioned time travelers, interdimensional beings, astral travelers, demons, extraterrestrials, ghosts and specters, the jinn, and of course, the explanations coming from the opposite side of the aisle. Our imagination met with fear, schizophrenia, and uh, other psychological disorders, drug use, lack of sleep, poor sleeping hygiene, including quality, time, and position. And we did briefly touch on a genetic component that could also play a part in certain folks' ability to see these figures. I cannot say that even one of the scientific explanations I have laid out could not be a contributing factor or disposition to this phenomenon. So yes, I do in fact believe that a lot of this phenomenon is completely explainable, completely addressable, completely solvable. There are encounters with these things that are originating from our own minds and therefore can be addressed and put to bed. Period. Full stop. But due to the strange connections synchronicities and inexplicable occurrences I mentioned just a second ago, topped with the frequency and tally of reported encounters, I think it is damn near impossible that every single one is explainable via science. I just do not believe that. I can't. 
it is not sufficient to me to say, well, since some of these experiences can be contributed to a completely logical scenario or reason, then that's all, folks. They all must be included in that pool. That's a wrap. Let's go home. No. 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 There are still too many questions left unanswered. Too many parts of this phenomenon that get set aside because of the uncomfortable pieces that remain a mystery because nobody has an answer for them. Now, does that mean that down the road we won't discover what actually causes sleep paralysis? Or that we all aren't on some primal level genetically predisposed to experience the paranormal, so it occurs much like a program that is already installed in the system, you know, some some ultimate explanation for it all? No, we could totally figure this stuff out and, and be done with it, move on to something more important. But until that time comes, I'm going to need to fill in the blanks for myself. What do I believe completes this mysterious portion of this equation? As I said in episode eight, I think there are a lot of things going on here. I promised a more concise conclusion, though. So I'll take a crack at narrowing down using process of elimination. I'm going to immediately say I do not think these things are time travelers. Not only does my gut scream frick no on this being in the possibility, um, in, in all of the literature and films I have consumed for research thus far, aside from people explicitly saying that, yes, these could be time travelers as they list off numerous other possibilities, I have yet to come across anything detailing out how or why this might be a good option. I have yet to see any explanation in support of this one, so I definitely was not swayed or sold here in any way. This next one, I feel, is going to be controversial. Demons. Don't think so. Sorry, not sorry, Christians, but I thank you wrong. A uh, couple reasons. One, not everything is a demon, Kevin. Chill out. Two, sometimes these encounters with shadow figures aren't actually all that bad, or literally not bad at all. Like, nothing happens. Three, not once. Have I read an encounter story where someone was possessed by a shadow person? Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that not Demon 101? Is it not? And this point stands so long as you do not, as I do not, take the old hag into account, as I have read in Rick Secker's book and seen just one or two encounter stories myself of people reporting her trying to... I guess you could say enter the body, climb into them, overtake them. She, she's doing something. Um, so sure, for the sake of argument, let's say the hag is trying to possess a body. One of the beliefs I formed over the course of the season is that she and the hooded figure and the hat man are not actually shadow figures. I agree with Heidi Hollis on this one. We'll talk a little bit, time permitting, as to how, in my opinion, they all can still exist on the same plane and interact with each other. Um, even work together toward the same goal. But uh, back to the argument at hand, though. The hag, in my opinion, is not a shadow person. So, shadow people are not trying to possess anybody. So, shadow people are not demons. <sighs> okay, I gotta take a breath here. Um, oh, how's everybody's margarita? I, uh, I ended up settling on a pink, bubbly Moscato. It's absolutely divine and oh so refreshing. Can't overdo it, though. Got to stay all profesh for you guys. But yes, I am celebrating. Looking forward to a much needed break between seasons, though. Uh, I think I mentioned before, but I will be taking a full month between seasons. Apologies to any of my diehards for the length of time, but I, I wanted to do a little reorganizing with the segments. Got to try and get a bulk of the basic Mandela research finished so I can more easily form and edit the episodes as we progress. Also going to try to find someone to help me out with the research portion. Um, I've sort of got a producer who helps me with some of the more technical aspects of this show. Um, I'll be thanking him later near the end, as well as a few others. But alas, I do the research oh so solo. Um, oh, and also I want to take some time investigating whether I would be able to swing a weekly episode rather than the current bi-weekly format. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if y'all would like something like that. I haven't been able to thus far, you guys. I'm, I'm pulling 40 plus hour weeks at work, uh, plus an hour commute both ways. I'm not complaining. I appreciate having money right now, but it doesn't leave a whole hell of a lot of time to do this thing I am so falling in love with. 
this is my art now. I missed it so damn much after I stopped acting a few years back. So thank you and shout out to David for being a gentle inspiration with all of your amazing art posts on IG and your incredible comments about making this a daily podcast. I wish, I really wish, bud. But for now, let's see if we can't just swing a weekly podcast. Um, I don't know how, but I'm going to figure it out. Okay. Okay. Gonna, gonna pull back from the weeds. <laughs> back back to the show. Um, okay. I, uh, I think there is an argument to be made for these humanoid shadowy figures uh, being the visages of people who are astral traveling. Why do I think this? Because I think there is also an argument to be made for these guys being the partially unmanifested forms of human spirits. And in my mind, Are we really splitting hairs here between human spirit and whatever it is that's coming up out your body when you're flitting around on the astral plane? Like, is that not your soul? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, For those with good memories, you'll recall on episode one, I said that if I had had to choose right at that moment what I thought the shadow people to be, it was ghosts, spirits of the deceased, because I thought it made sense at the time. And I do still hold this belief, but only partially now. That plays into my idea now that we are experiencing a few different things when we run into the shadow people. And this is a shared belief with a couple of the experts I mentioned previously that some of these guys are unmanifested ghosts. And since I am fully on board for shadow animals being the not fully manifested forms of our passed on fur children, then why wouldn't I hold the same openness in regards to passed on people? Extraterrestrials. While there is a massive connection to be made between aliens and shadow people, um, Rosemary Ellen Guiley talked about it, Heidi Hollis talks about it, the connection is discussed on numerous online platforms and forums and numerous articles and opinion pieces and blogs and podcasts, I do not actually think that shadow people themselves are the ETs, or vice versa. I think they are two separate entities. Or creatures, rather. I think the connection becomes clearer when we consider that we might be dealing with um, a couple of scenarios. Uh, Scenario one, shadow people are actually a paranormal entity that exists on an entirely different vibration and plane. And the extraterrestrials are beings who have learned how to manipulate said vibration. So they both can stand shoulder to shoulder and be seen or experienced at the same time. Or... Both the shadow people and the extraterrestrials are both living beings who have similarly learned to manipulate vibrations and now are both emerging into our vibrational plane for whatever reason. It would seem at the onset that both extraterrestrials and shadow figures have a common stake in the goings on of the human race as aside from stories of like cow mutilations or activity caught on camera that where no person was actually present at the time, humans do seem to be a common denominator here. The next two I'm mentioning, I'm putting under the umbrella of, yes, these are absolutely possibilities, but unfortunately, I don't have enough information to throw my belief behind either. (sighs) That's a big title for this section. Okay, the djinn. I think Rosemary Ellen Guiley was onto something, really. It seemed that she was able to, over the years, make this connection with a lot of the paranormal topics and entities she studied. And ultimately, I think that connection was the djinn. It was how she was able to answer a lot of the questions that she had. And she certainly knew a lot about the djinn. And hell, if the shoe fits, you know, uh, if all roads seem to lead to the djinn, well, you know. And second... And this might be just one of the coolest and more interesting theories I have heard, but the topic itself deserves a full exploration on my part. Here it is. Um, We are in a simulation, and these shadow beings that we are seeing and experiencing are from the outside looking in. They are hacking into the system in order to possibly experience this life game as is laid out in the sim, Or they are actually architects or programmers who are just trying to reset something, fix a glitch, and seeing them on our part is actually accidental, which would explain the oh-fuckness and quick scoot and skedaddle that a lot of them seem to do. Um, I would react the same way if I thought I was totally invisible and I turned to find some creepy kid sitting straight up in bed staring right at my dumb ass. (laughs) 
um, this theory, though, can open the door to a bunch of different possibilities, and it can easily get away from you. For instance, are they hacking the simulation in order to elicit fear, not necessarily to feed off of it, but to feel it for themselves? Hmm? Maybe that's why they are so curious about us. Staring us right in our faces while we sleep, a uh, human emotion confounds them because it is not a reality of actual reality. Or are these guys the viruses of the program? Are we literally living out the Matrix movies? See, fascinating, but can definitely escape you into what-if world. So anyway, I'll just leave it at that. A little food for thought. And finally, interdimensional beings. Bingo! I did not hold this belief at the beginning of all of this, but I sure do now. I think one of the stupidest ideas ever had is that we are alone in this universe. It's absurd. And once again, such a human thought supportive of our own self-assigned importance in the whole scheme of things. I similarly think it's rather stupid to assume that this is the only timeline. This is the only plane of existence. This is the only vibration or set of frequencies that exist and that the third dimension is the end of the line. And, and it, don't get me wrong, it is absolutely mind-boggling when you try to think your way beyond length, width, and depth. You ever tried? Some brains just will not go there. They can't. But just because we cannot comprehend of it now doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Have you ever tried to melt your own brain thinking about what's beyond the edge of the universe? What it looks like? What holds it all in? Ooh, ooh, ooh. If, if there is a creator... Who created them? Ugh, fried. A lot of people think that string theory is bollocks, a waste of time. But what if it isn't? It is at its basic level, a way to explain something outrageously big and complicated in a simplified manner, such as the example in a video I'm gonna link to in the show notes regarding the blueprints for building a small boat. Can those blueprints also be used to build a cruise ship or eventually over time learn some things about how to build one since both things are fundamentally the same, things that float? So in this way, string theory can help us to understand reality and the nature of everything by breaking it down and looking at it through the limitations of our known reality. However, it requires the universe operate within 10 dimensions to work. 10. It's math works under these parameters, but does not work in our three spatial and one temporal dimensions world. And its math is, for the most part, very, very good and very accurate. Or so I'm told in that video. <laughs> you know, I think my favorite part about the idea that shadow people may be interdimensional beings is this feeling that it could be the missing link I'm pining for between science and the paranormal. But ugh, yeah, this, this stuff blows my mind away. So string theory is just theoretical physics. But again, the math checks out using 10 dimensions, again, according to the video. Well, that says to me, kind of, that, yeah, it's entirely possible that there are more dimensions. Physicists aren't just sitting around looking for ways to waste time and resources coming up with this stuff. Some incredibly smart people came up with string theory. I love physics so much. I do. I, I read all, like, all the articles that I come across. I watch the videos. Do I understand it? No, not, not one bit. Do I understand string theory? I barely understand how string cheese is possible. So no, no, not in the slightest. I'm literally verbally regurgitating what I just learned in a video. So just don't come at me. I'm, I'm not here to fight over controversial science stuff. Already know I will not win. It will be an easy win for you. Totally random, but um, it just occurred to me that I think that uh, uh, there's a science channel I follow on YouTube called Answers with Joe. I think he did a show on string theory. I'm uh, totally embarrassed myself if this is not right, because I'm actually just thinking about this. If I can find it, I will put a link for it below. <laughs> Watch it. If you love comedy and sciencey topics being broken down for you uh, so you can actually understand them, check his channel out. You'll absolutely love it. So anyway, 
In my opinion, yes, there are multiple dimensions. In my opinion, if there are multiple dimensions, then then it's likely that there are beings, creatures, entities, some sort of existing forms that we cannot even begin to comprehend living in these other places. There's a really good passage about interdimensional beings coming here to our dimension, which can be found in Jason Offit's book. He writes that a common explanation given in support of shadow figures being interdimensional and what is occurring when we run into them is that somehow their dimension is bleeding into our own. That sometimes these various dimensions can cross, making it entirely possible for us to come into contact with each other. Mr. Offit quotes Marie Jones, author of P.S. Science, how discoveries in quantum physics and new science may explain the existence of paranormal phenomena. Long title. Um, She discusses three concepts that might come into play here if they are, in fact, interdimensional beings. I'm going to abridge what she says, but not change the context. She says, theoretically, infinite other universes exist. We shouldn't physically be able to access them based on our own laws of physics, yet it can be entertained that perhaps the laws of physics on the other side, and she's talking about the other dimension here, don't match our laws of physics, and therefore allow them to cross over. Her second concept involves resonant synchronization of energy, opening a doorway between dimensions, just long enough for something to slip through. And the third concept she talks about is called the zero point field. She says it's an energy field that fills a vacuum and contains the landscape of the past, present, and future all happening at once. All people who have ever died are currently living or are going to live are here. And she thinks there is a possibility that certain people like healers, mediums, remote viewers, even artists... Um, who are able to access this field, that this is where they are getting their information. It literally sounds like a hard drive for a computer um, where everything is stored. She says, with this possibility, though, that there may also be entities coming from that field and manifesting in our reality before vanishing and returning back to the field. She says this could explain the nature of ghosts and shadow people. Super cool stuff. My final reason for thinking shadow people are interdimensional beings is because, according to all of the encounters I've read, they seem to have some sort of actual physical-like body of sorts, though they are not abiding by our laws of physical reality. What I mean by physical-like They appear to have size and shape, but no actual mass, as they can be seen disappearing into walls. Or they can have mass and weight, but no actual size, shape, or distinct form. This might be when people report feeling grabbed, scratched, choked, interacted with in some way physically, but maybe do not experience a visual with the encounter. So... This ability to be fully seen or fully felt in a physical sense says to me that they are actual beings. For lack of a better word, they are living beings. But as far as I am aware, things that do not abide by our physical rules cannot exist in this physical reality. The shit breaks apart. So they gotta be coming from and disappearing to somewhere. All right, getting down to the wire, folks. Um... I said I would explain my thoughts on how the hat man, old hag, and the hooded figure can both interact with shadow people but not be shadow people themselves. The reason I don't think they are shadow people is because they don't follow the pattern. If you were able to categorize everything you knew about shadow figures, at the end of it all, their appearance, their interactions, their capabilities are all fairly similar and actually quite simple on paper. It seems to follow a basic, uh, well, pretty basic template in my experience. It is only when we try to introduce these more specific, almost archetypal characters that the waters get muddied a little bit. It gets very difficult to continue seeing that pattern because each of these characters all have their own set of appearances, interactions, and capabilities. The differences are so distinct. It says to me that we aren't just talking about a different breed. We're talking about a different animal altogether. If I absolutely had to put a label on these guys, this is where I would group them. The hooded figure, I think, is an interdimensional being. 
though separate from shadow people. I think this thing has been around for a very long time, tying itself to a ton of our mythologies throughout the centuries, and I think it's actually coming to us from another plane of existence, possibly even originating from somewhere like the astral plane, as a lot of seemingly dark and mysterious creatures have been reported to have been encountered by people astral projecting. The old hag, well, you might be right this time, Kevin. Uh, I think the lady is a demon. Also older than dirt, this entity has been with us for a while. I would absolutely slap her together with the incubi and succubi as nighttime pressing demonic entities whose ultimate motivation is control over a human's body, whether that be with sex, as with the incubus and succubus, or with fear and terror and physical manhandling, as in the case of the old hag. Um, it's interesting to me that she only seems to strike during people's dreams or immediately surrounding them, and never seems to have any of these broad daylight sightings that can occur with the hooded figure or the hat man. It makes me think she's not an incredibly powerful being. Uh, that's probably going to come and bite me in the ass at some point soon. Um, and that she's also a true opportunist, striking while our guard is down and when we can't defend ourselves, which... Sounds pretty demonic in nature to me. And of course, the hat man. It has bothered me ever since I covered him on episode four that the guy doesn't seem to have an origin story or even much of a history. He just started appearing within the last hundred years or so. And my empathy for this character kind of boggled my mind a little bit. Um, I couldn't help feeling that way, though. I kept feeling this sense of compassion because I kept seeing how human his interactions with us were. For better or for worse, it's how I interpreted everything. And this thought that just would not go away. He is us. He is us. So it took me a long time to arrive at this opinion. I still feel that it is not complete, but it'll do for now. I most definitely did not believe this about the hat man a few months ago, but here it is. I think the hat man is our collective tulpa. I think we gave birth to this guy. We did this. It just fits for now, you guys. Um, we see him wearing a hat and suit, but He's got this flexibility to change up the look, never appearing the same from encounter to encounter. Um, there's good run-ins with him. There's bad. Sometimes there's sleep paralysis and he's sitting on your chest, choking you within an inch of your life. Or you may see him in broad daylight, just standing across the street, staring intently. Of course, um, I'll keep my mind open if I should hear a valid and convincing argument otherwise, but he just did not exist before the turn of the century, right when the top hat became a popular accessory. This would also be the time of Jack the Ripper, who, according to the few eyewitness testimonies, publicly reported him as a well-dressed gentleman. If that were the case, he would have been wearing a top hat, and the following stories and lore about him certainly forever cemented that image of a tall, dark man shrouded in shadows in a top hat into our collective consciousness and collective emotional fear. Not saying that the hat man is the tulpa born of just those early fears of Jack the Ripper, but it's interesting to me that that did indeed seemingly come first, along with the popularity of top hats themselves. He could quite literally be the tulpa simply born of our innate fear of authority, often symbolized by the image of men in hats and characters throughout our history, such as Jack the Ripper, or the Babadook, the uh, Zorro, Freddy, Men in Black, um, who all simply continued to feed into the collective emotional brew for this ultimate tulpa creation. Now, all that being said, I'm, <laughs> I'm realizing that some of you might not know what a tulpa is. Okay, straight from the Wikipedia page, um, a tulpa is the paranormal concept of a being or object which is brought into existence via spiritual or mental powers. The resulting being is considered to be sentient and autonomous. So, the hat man is real, y'all. Give yourselves a little pat on the back. Now, 
If all of these guys are so different, how can they interact with each other? I believe that comes down to vibration and frequency. Everything has a different vibration. We've already talked about the spectrum of visible light and the infinite amount of frequencies that cannot be heard and wavelengths not visible to the human eye. It is my belief that all of these beings and entities we would term as paranormal are existing in wavelengths and frequencies and vibrations dissimilar to our own. And they may very well be at different levels from each other, but some are bound to be closer to some over others, able to mesh more easily or even coexist. Meh. It's my theory for now, anyway. So, there you have it, you guys. When the shadow people being experienced cannot be explained via completely logical, traditional, and scientific reasons, they are interdimensional beings. And sometimes human spirits. And the hat man is a tulpa. Who would have thought? I want to thank my tech guy, Jeremy, from getting me set up with all of the right equipment and programs to teaching me how to use the damn things, to being more than willing and happy to figure out whatever it was I just fucked up big time, uh, which seemed a constant occurrence for me, I'll admit. You're a genius, dude. Thank you. And a special thank you to someone who provided me with some studies and papers I was having serious trouble locating. I know you wish to remain anonymous for professional reasons. This, uh, this was way back at the beginning of all of this, but I hadn't forgot your kindness, and I just wanted to officially thank you. Thank you so much for your help. Thanks to my family, my coworkers, and my friends for your support and for being the best beta listeners a girl can have. Thank you to Lee. Thank you for your support and for the funny. You are the best. And thanks to all of you. I thought being a skeptical believer was lone wolf territory. But since I've started this show, I've talked to and met some incredible peeps who couldn't uh, empathize more with that description. So to all of you listening out there, for anyone who hung in there and followed along for the entire season, you made me feel so special and heard after what has been an incredibly tough and lonely couple of years. I, I really cannot wait to pick up a season two, and I really hope you guys are there for it. I, I hope to see you there. Um, if you guys have enjoyed the season, do me a solid and give the show a good rating and review. I hate asking for stuff, period. But I really do want to see this podcast get a fair shake if it's any good. And in order to do that, I, I got to be visible to the masses. And the only way to do that is to interact with y'all on the social. Um, if you give reviews everywhere so new listeners might become interested, share with your friends and leaving ratings so it pops PGP up closer to the top of the screen in the search feature. I think that's how this algorithm works anyway. Um, okay, all that's done. I thank you all so much in advance. Y'all rock my world. That's it for now, you skeptical lot. But I know this episode let alone this season, would not be complete without leaving you all with a final note. According to a study held in 2005, it was found that around 70% of the world's population believes in ghosts. That is 5.4 billion people. And of that number, Approximately 2 billion people alive today claim to have had some physical interaction with one, whether that be seeing, hearing, or being touched by one. And that's just ghosts. This number does not include abductions, or Bigfoot sightings, or possessions. So who knows what the actual number is? No matter what it is, it appears, my friends, that if you do not hold some belief in or have never had some sort of paranormal experience, encounter, or the like, you are actually in the minority here. People fear what they do not understand. It's natural. It's normal. But when a subject that a majority of people believe to be real, that so many have personally experienced, isn't even allowed a seat at the table, it's odd to me. This over-rationalization, this scrambling to try and convince the masses that it's nothing. Shadow people is not an everyday concept meant for everyone. The concept can be uncomfortable, make you feel uneasy. It can downright terrify. But maybe it wouldn't 
if we could talk about it in terms that didn't make people feel crazy or odd for discussing their experience. If we could talk about it inside of the parameters of science rather than excusing it away or excluding it altogether. One surprising thing I learned from doing this show was how a subject like this could bring so many people together that so many more people have been affected by the paranormal than I could have ever imagined prior to this. That I wasn't alone in my hesitancy to pick a belief because I didn't want to be wrong. That there was so much more to learn than the average person gets to. And after immersing myself in it, how much more confident I feel that I was right all along, that there is something going on. I just didn't know it yet. A second surprising part is my inner belief that if I were to discover for myself that the paranormal can actually be a winning horse in this race, that my respect for science would decline. You know what? Couldn't be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, I'm all in to see the two worlds married now. But there's a final surprising bit about all of this that I really want to see change in the future. Aside to this that I was not prepared for. When having the spiritual versus science debate, it's not just us against a big bad them. It can quite often be other believers that create a bit of impenetrability, who are stopping the conversation that needs to be had from what I have seen so far, it's born out of fear. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. We're all on the same side here. We all want to know, all want to understand. Our desire to learn more should outweigh our instinct to fear. You're not protecting anyone when you're Mr. It's a Demon on Reddit. In short, don't be that guy. Be braver than that. Your curiosity brought you here, so let it take you further. As I have said before, nothing is as black and white as it seems at first glance. Nothing. I will leave you with this. Plato's allegory, the cave, was presented to compare the effect of education and the lack of it on our nature. The masses are the prisoners, chained to the wall since childhood, watching the shadows displayed across that wall and calling it true reality. Even giving the shapes and objects labels and names to make it make sense. The echoes bouncing off of the walls are coming from the shadows themselves, so thank the prisoners. This is what they know to be true. We are the prisoner who is freed and can now see the moon and the stars, the trees, the fire, the sun. And we can see now that the shadows themselves were not reality, but a representation, an extension of a true reality that the rest of the prisoners are quite content to play no part in. In fact, when they see us struggling to even see once back inside the darkness of the cave after having been out in that sun, there is no need to dig any deeper, look closer, pull anything apart to put it all back together when they are seemingly staring a perfectly good and safe reality right in its face. I find it interesting that Plato used shadows to get his point across. Have a wonderful rest of your summer, guys. Until next time. Stay safe, keep that nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.